are in the marketplace of Speisersaal, the capital of the Grand Duchy of Pfennig Halbpfennig. It is the summer of 1750. Seated outside an inn are the members of the local theatrical company, which is managed by one Ernest Dummkopf. They are enjoying a repast in honour of the nuptials of Ludwig, his leading comedian, and Lisa, his soubrette. taken place. <laughs> My good girls, one at a time, I beg. Let me understand the situation. As solicitor um, to the conspiracy to dethrone the Grand Duke, um, a conspiracy in which the members of this company are deeply involved, I am invited to the marriage of two of its members. I present myself in due course, and I find not only that the ceremony has taken place, which is not of the least consequence, but the wedding breakfast is half eaten, which is a consideration of the most serious importance. 
But the ceremony has not taken place. We can't get a parson. Can't get a parson? Why, how's that there three a penny? Oh, it is the old story. The Grand Duke. Oh, oh the... him. It seems that the little imp has selected this, our wedding day, for a convocation of all the clergy in the town to settle the details of his approaching marriage with the enormously wealthy Baroness von Krakenfeld, and there won't be a parson to be had for love or money until six o'clock this evening. And as we produce our magnificent classical revival of Twilight and Cressida tonight at seven, we've no alternative but to eat our wedding breakfast before we've earned it. So sit down and make the best of it. <laughs> oh, I should like to pull his grand ducal ears for him, that I should. He's the meanest, the cruelest, the most spiteful little ape in Christendom. Well, we shall soon be freed from his tyranny. Tomorrow the death pot is to be dethroned. Hush, rash girl. Know ye not that in alluding to our conspiracy, without having first given and received the secret sign, you are violating a fundamental principle of our association? By the mystic regulation of a dark association, ere you open conversation with another kindred soul, you must eat a sausage roll. And he eats another That's a sign that he's a brother Each may fully trust the other It is quaint and it is dull But it's brilliant on the whole It's a greedy kind of pasty Which perhaps a judgment hasty Might consider rather tasty Wants to speak without disguise It found favour in our eyes Found favour, found favour in our eyes but when you've been six months feeding, as we have on this exceeding brilliant food, it's no ill breeding. If that these repulsive pies are offended, God is All this is rank treason to the cause. I suffer as much as any of you. I loathe the repulsive thing. I can't contemplate it without a shudder. But I'm a conscientious conspirator, and if you won't give the sign, I will. Poor martyr. He's always at it. It's a wonder where he puts it. <clears throat> well, now, about <clears throat> Troilus and Cressida, what do you play? <clears throat> If you will be so obliging as to wait until I've got rid of this feeling of warm oil at the bottom of my throat, I'll tell you all about it. Some brandy, Lucy. Ah, thank you, my love. Ah, thank you. It's gone. <laughs> well, Truillus and Cressida will be produced upon a scale of unexampled magnificence. It is confidently predicted that my appearance as King Agamemnon in a Louis XIV wig will mark an epoch in the theatrical annals of Fenig Hab Fenig. I endeavoured to persuade Ernest Dumkopf, our manager, to lend us the classical dresses for our marriage. Think of the effect of a real Athenian wedding procession cavorting through the streets of Spicesar. Oh. Torches burning, cymbals banging, flutes tootling, cithari twanging, and a throng of fifty lovely Spartan virgins capering before us, all down the high street, singing, A lawyer, a lawyer, a poponax, a lawyer. It would have been tremendous. And he declined? He did, on the prosaic ground that it might rain, and the ancient Greeks did not carry umbrellas. If, as is confidently expected, Ernest Dumkopf is elected to succeed the dethroned one, mark my words, he will make a mess of it. Come, Lisa. 
Ernest is sure to be elected. Our entire company has promised to plump for him on the understanding that all the places about the court are filled by members of his troop, according to professional precedent. Here comes Ernest, John oh. Now we shall know all about it. Yeah, well, how you are the you? going, Ernest? Oh, it's a certainty, a practical certainty. Two of the candidates have been arrested for debt, and the third is a baby in arms. Oh. So, if you keep your promises and vote solid, I'm cock-sure of election. Chuck to us. But you remember the conditions. Yes, all of you shall be provided for, for life. Oh. Every man shall be ennobled. Ah. Every lady shall have unlimited credit at the court milliners. Oh. And all salaries shall be paid weekly in advance. Oh, it's quite clear he knows how to rule a grand duchy. Rule a grand duchy? Why, my good girl, for ten years past, I've ruled a theatrical company. A man who can do that can rule anything. <laughs> Were I a king in very truth And had a son, a guileless youth In probable succession To teach him patience, teach him tact How from being a fix to act He should adopt in point of fact A manager's profession To that condition he should do Beside the true fond mother with eight or ten stars in his group, all jealous of each other, all jealous of each other. Oh, the man who can rule a theatrical group, each member a genius and some of them too, and manage to deliver them early and late, and govern this company's state. Oh, the man who can rule a theatrical group, each member a genius and some of them too, and manage to deliver them early and late, and govern this company's state. Light. They say they'll be all right at night. They both to go to school yet. Seeny Jack must change her dress. Dee will attempt to square the press. He won't play Romeo unless his grandmother plays Juliet. Their claims are hoidens as her rights. She's played them 30 seasons. And Dee must show herself in sight. For two convincing reasons to very well take reason. For oh, the man who can drive a theatrical team with wheelers and leaders in order to see can govern and rule with a wave of his pin for Europe with her and for me. For the man who can drive a theatrical team with wheelers and leaders in order to see can govern and rule with a wave of his pin. Elected by my fellow conspirators to be Grand Duke of Fenig How Fenig, as soon as the contemptible little occupant of the historical throne is deposed. Here is promotion indeed. Why, instead of playing Troilus of Troy for a month, I shall play Grand Duke of Fenig How Fenig for a lifetime. Yes, am I happy? No, far from happy. The lovely English comedian, the beautiful Julia whose dramatic ability is so overwhelming that our audiences forgive even her strong English accents. That rare and radiant being treats my respectful advances with disdain unutterable. And yet, who knows, she is haughty and ambitious, and it may be that the splendid change in my fortunes may work a corresponding change in her feelings towards me. Herr Dunkoff. A word with you, if you please. Beautiful English maiden. Uh, no compliments, I beg. I desire to speak with you on a purely professional matter. So we will, if you please, dispense with allusions to my personal appearance, which can only tend to widen the breach which already exists between us. My only hope shattered. The haughty Londoner still despises me. It shall be as you will. I understand that the conspiracy in which we are all concerned is to develop tomorrow and that the company is likely to elect you to the throne on the understanding that the posts about the court are to be filled by members of your theatrical troupe, according to their professional importance. That is so. 
Uh, then all I can say is that it places me in an extremely awkward position. I don't see how it concerns you. Oh, why, bless my heart, don't you see that as your leading lady, I'm bound under a serious penalty to play the leading part in all your productions. Well? Why, of course, the leading part in this production will be the Grand Duchess. My wife. But that is another way of expressing the same idea. I scarcely dared even to hope for this. Of course, as your leading lady, you'll be mean enough to hold me to the terms of my agreement. Oh, that's so like a man. Well, I suppose there's no help for it. I shall have to do it. She's mine. But do you really think you would care to play that part? Care to play it? Certainly not. But what am I to do? Business is business, and I'm bound by the terms of the agreement. It's for a long run, mind, a run that may last many, many years. No understudy, and once embarked upon, there's no throwing it up. Oh, we are used to these long runs in England. They're the curse of the stage. But you see, I've no option. You think the part of Grand Duchess will be good enough for you? Oh, I think so. It's a very good part in Gerolstein, and oughtn't to be a bad one in Fennig Halbfennig. Why? What did you suppose I was going to play? But considering your strong personal dislike to me and your persistent rejection of my repeated offers, won't you find it difficult to throw yourself into the part with all the impassioned enthusiasm that the character seems to demand? Mm -hmm. Remember, it's a strongly emotional part involving long and repeated scenes of rapture, tenderness, adoration, devotion, all in luxuriant excess. And all of a most demonstrative description. My good sir, throughout my career I have made it a rule never to allow private feeling to interfere with my professional duty. You may be quite sure that, however distasteful the part may be, if I undertake it, I shall consider myself professionally bound to throw myself into it with all the ardour at my command. I'm the happiest fellow alive. Now, would you have any objection to... To give me some idea, if it's only a mere sketch as to how you would play it, it would be really interesting to me to, to know your conception of, um, of the, the part of my wife. How I would play it? Uh, now, let me see. Hmm, let me see. Ah, I have it. How would I play this part? The grand duke bride, all rancor in my heart, I do it. I drive it from my recollection, and when you win the mock confession, we'll calculate it to defy dissection. That's how I play this part. The grand duke bride, with many a winter smile, I'd wish and woo with gay and girlish guile. I'd friend you. I'd madden you with my caresses, like that little half a clock confessing. Yet it was not no more to me guessing. With so much wind of wine, I'd wish and woo. Did any other maid with you succeed? I'd finish the forward jade, I would indeed. With jealous frenzy I'd be created, which would, of course, be stimulated. I'd make a wish it never been created. I'd make a wish it never been created. I'd make a wish it never been created. Did any other maid with you succeed? Then should there come Three. <laughs> 
What must I do? What was the dreadful situation? I'm sure I don't know where to go. It put me into such a temper. But this at all events, I know the sooner we are off, the better. Yes, the sooner off, the better. What means this agitato? What do you seek? As your grand duke, I bid you <clears throat> Ten minutes since I met a chap who bowed an easy salutation. Thinks I, this gentleman may have belonged to our association. But on the whole, uncertain yet, a sausage roll I took and ate. That chap replied, I don't embellish by eating three with obvious relish. <laughs> Should I let him know our plot it is not explaining? This stranger chuckled much as though he thought me highly entertaining. I told him all, both bad and good. I bade him call, he said he would. I added much, the more I muttered, the more that chuckling chum me chuckled. <laughs> To his applause, down dropped he with his headache fellow, and that seemed right enough because I am a devilish funny fellow. Then suddenly, as still he squealed, it flashed on me that I'd revealed a plot with all details effective to Grand Duke Rudolph's own detective. <laughs> Well, a nice mess you've got us into. There's an end to our precious plot. All up, pop, fizzle, punk, done for. Yes, but uh, fancy my choosing the Grand Duke's private detective of all men to make a confidant of. When you come to think of it, it's really devilish funny. When you come to think of it, it's extremely injudicious to admit into a conspiracy every pudding-headed baboon who presents himself. Yes, I should never do that. If I were chairman of this gang, I should hesitate to enroll any baboon who couldn't produce satisfactory credentials from his last zoological garden. Ludwig is far from being a baboon. Poor boy. He couldn't help giving us away. It's his trusting nature. He was deceived. His trusting nature. Oh, I should like to talk to you in my own language for five minutes. Only five minutes. I know some good strong, energetic English remarks that would shrivel your trusting nature into raisins. Only you wouldn't understand them. Uh, here we perceive one of the disadvantages of a neglected education. And I suppose you'll never be my Grand Duchess now. Grand Duchess? My good friend, if you don't produce the piece, how can I play the part? True. You see what you've done? But, my dear sir, 
You don't seem to understand that the man ate three sausage rolls. Keep that fact steadily before you. Three large sausage rolls. Oh, lots of people eat sausage rolls who are not conspirators. Then they shouldn't. It is bad form. It is not the game. When one of the human family proposes to eat a sausage roll, it is his duty to ask himself, am I a conspirator? And if on examination he finds that he is not a conspirator, he is bound in honor to select some other form of refreshment. Of course he is. One should always play the game. <laughs> what are you grinning at, you greedy old man? No, nothing. Don't mind me. It is always amusing to the legal mind to see a parcel of laymen bothering themselves about a matter which to a, <laughs> a trained lawyer presents no difficulty whatever. No, no difficulty? difficulty. <laughs> None whatever. The way out of it is quite simple. Simple? simple. Certainly. Now, <laughs> attend. In the first place, you two men fight a statutory duel. A statutory duel? A stat... Hey, tortutory jewel. Ah, what a cracked your language this German is. I've never heard of such a thing. Uh, it is true that the practice has fallen into abeyance through this use. <laughs> but all the laws of Fenny Calfenig run for a hundred years uh, when they die a natural death. Unless, <laughs> in the meantime, they have been revived for another century. The act that institutes the statutory duel was passed a hundred years ago. And as it has never been revived, it expires tomorrow. <laughs> no, so you're just in time. But what is the use of talking to us about a statutory duel when we none of us know what a statutory duel is? Don't you? <laughs> then I'll explain. <laughs> About a century since, the code of the duello to sudden death for want of breath sent many a strapping fellow. The then presiding prince, who useless bloodshed hated, he passed an act short and compact, which may be briefly stated. Unlike the complicated laws of parliamentary draftsman draws, it may be briefly stated. We know the complicated laws of parliamentary draftsman draws, and no be briefly stated. By this ingenious law, if any two shall quarrel, they may not fight with false and fright, which seem to him immoral. But each a card shall draw, and he who draws the lowest shall so to said be henceforth dead. In fact, a legal goest. When exigence of rhyme compels, orthography for ghost herself, and ghost is writ and goest. With what talent and sympathy, when the form of honesty and friends are kind of Have wept their woe, encounter her feet affliction. The winner must adopt the loser's poor relations, discharge his debts, pay all his bets, and take his obligations. The winner must adopt the loser's poor relations, discharge his debts, pay all his bets, discharge his debts, pay all his bets, and take his obligations. In short, to briefly sum the case, the winner takes the loser face with all its obligations. A victory or a sin, a sin, the winner takes the loser face with all its obligations. A victory or a sin, a sin, the winner takes the loser face. A victory or a sin, a sin, the winner takes the loser face with all its obligations. The man who draws the lowest card dies, it's so facto, a social death. He loses all his civil rights, his um, identity disappears. The revising barrister expunges his name from the list of voters, and the winner, the winner takes his place 
Mm, whatever it may be, discharges all his functions and adopts all his responsibilities. This is all very well as far as it goes, but it only protects one of us. What's to become of the survivor? Mm. <laughs> the survivor goes at once to the Grand Duke and in a burst of remorse denounces the uh, <laughs> dead man as the moving spirit of the plot. He is accepted as king's evidence and as a matter of course receives a free pardon. Tomorrow, when the law expires, the uh, dead man will, if so facto, come to life again. The revising barrister will restore his name to the list of voters, and he will resume all his obligations as though nothing unusual had happened. When he will be at once arrested, tried, and executed on the evidence of the informer. Candidly, my friends, I don't think much of your plot. <laughs> dear, 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 the ignorance of the lad. <laughs> my good young lady... It is a beautiful maxim of our most glorious constitution that a man can only die once. Death expunges crime, and when he comes to life again, it will be with a clean slate. It's really uh, very ingenious. My dear sir, we owe you our lives. Ludwig, may I kiss you? Oh, <laughs> certainly not. You're a big girl now. Well, miscreant, are you prepared to meet me on the field of honor? At once. By Jove, what a couple of fire-eaters we are. Ludwig doesn't know what fear is. Oh, I don't mind this sort of duel. Oh, it's not like a duel with swords. I hate a duel with swords. It's not the blade I mind. It's the blood. And I hate a duel with pistols. It's not the ball I mind. It's the bang. Altogether, it is a great improvement on the old method of giving satisfaction. Oh, 
Whatever our fate, let's play our part. Hurrah, hurrah, have gone and ain't hey, 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 goes off to spend his statutory 24 hours as a dead man. The notary takes charge of the ladies and Ludwig sets out to find the Grand Duke. But here, preceded by seven chamberlains, is the Grand Duke Rudolf himself. He is meanly and miserably dressed in old and patched clothes, but blazes with a profusion of orders and decorations. He is very weak and ill from low living. Professors of monarchical autonomy, I don't indulge in levity or compromising bonomy, but dignified formality consistent with economy. Above all other virtues I particularly prize, I never 
never join in merriment. I don't see joke or shape penny. I never tolerate familiarity in shape penny. This joined with an extravagant respect for top and tape penny. A keynote to my character sufficiently supplied. <laughs> Observe. My snuff box. Snuff box? and sugar with precision mathematical instead of beer a penny each my orders are emphatical extravagance on pardonable any more than that i call but on the other hand my ducal dignity to keep all courtly ceremonial to put it comprehensively i rigidly insist upon but not i hope offensively whenever ceremonial can be practiced inexpensively and when you come to think of it it's really very cheap observe my handkerchief and it's really very cheap. <laughs> <coughs> my Lord Chamberlain, as you are aware, my marriage with the wealthy Baroness von Krakenfeld will take place tomorrow and you will be good enough to see that the rejoicings are on a scale of unusual liberality. Quite it. Pass that on. Liberal rejoicings? Liberal rejoicings. Liberal rejoicings. Liberal rejoicings. The sports will begin with a wedding breakfast bee. The leading pastry cooks of the town will be invited to compete, and the winner will not only enjoy the satisfaction of seeing his breakfast devoured by the Grand Ducal pair, but he will also be entitled to have the arms of Fennec Huffenick tattooed between his shoulder blades. The Vice Chamberlain will see to this. Tattoo. Tattoo. <laughs> Tattoo. 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 All the public fountains of Spicersal will run with ginger beer heim and currant vine milch at the public expense. The assistant vice chamberlain will say to this Current vine milch, current vine milch, current vine milch, current wine. Yeah. At night, everybody will illuminate. And as I have no desire to tax the public funds unduly, this will be done at the inhabitants' private expense. The Deputy Assistant Vice Chamberlain will say to this. Illuminate. 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 All my Grand Ducal subjects will wear new clothes, and the Sub-Deputy Assistant Vice Chamberlain will collect the usual commission on all sales. Commission. Commission. Mission. Done. Ah, wedding presents, which on this occasion should be on a scale of extraordinary magnificence, will be received at the palace at any hour of the 24th. And the temporary sub-deputy assistant vice chamberlain will sit up all night for this purpose. Wedding presents. 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 The entire population will be commanded to enjoy themselves. And with this view, the acting temporary sub-deputy assistant vice chamberlain will sing comic songs in the marketplace from noon till nightfall. Comic songs. Comic song. Comic song. We catch Lord Trey. Not now, upon. not now. Finally, we have composed a wedding anthem with which the entire population are required to provide themselves. It can be obtained from our grand ducal publishers at the usual discount price. And all the Chamberlains will be expected to push the sale. Highness, Highness, Highness. Go away now. Highness, Go away. Highness, <laughs> I don't feel at all comfortable. Hope I'm not doing a foolish thing in getting married. After all, it's a poor heart that never rejoices, and this wedding of mine is the first little treat I've allowed myself since my christening. Besides, Caroline's income is very considerable, and as her ideas of economy are quite on a par with mine, it ought to turn out well. Bless her tough old heart, she's a mean little darling. Oh, here she is. Punctual to her appointment. Rudolph! 
Oh. <coughs> Why, what's the matter? Why, I'm not quite myself, my pet. I'm a little worried and upset. I want a tonic. It's a low diet, I think. I'm afraid, after all, I shall have to take the bull by the horns and have an egg with my breakfast. I shouldn't do anything rash, dear. Begin with the juju. I'll keep it for supper. Ah, Caroline. <laughs> don't, Olive, don't. What in the world are you thinking of? I was thinking of embracing you, my sugar plum. <laughs> Just as a little cheap treat. What, here? In public? Really, you appear to have no sense of delicacy. No sense of delicacy, Bombo? No. I can't make you out. When you courted me, all your courting was done publicly in the marketplace. When you proposed to me, you proposed in the marketplace. And now that we're engaged, you seem to desire that our first tete-a-tete -tete shall occur in the marketplace. Surely you've a room in your palace with blinds that would do. With my own, I can't help myself. I'm bound by my own decree. Your own decree? Yes, you see, all the houses that give on the marketplace belong to me. But the drains, which date back to the reign of Charlemagne, want attending to, and the houses wouldn't let. So with a view of increasing the value of the property, I decreed that all love episodes between affectionate couples should take place in public on this spot every Monday, Wednesday and Friday when the band doesn't play. Bless me, what a happy idea. <laughs> so model too. And have you found it answer? Answer? Oh, the rents have gone up 50% and the sale of opera glasses, which is a grand ducal monopoly, has received an extraordinary stimulus. So... Under the circumstances, would you allow me to put my arm round your waist as a source of income? Oh. Oh, just one. But it's so very embarrassing. Think of the opera glasses. My good girl, that's just what I am thinking of. Hang it all, we must give them something for their money. What's that? It's a letter which your detective asked me to hand to you. I wrapped it up in yesterday's paper to keep it clean. No, it's only his report. That'll keep. But I say. You've never been and bought a newspaper. My dear Rudolph, do you think I'm mad? It came wrapped round my breakfast. Oh, I thought you were not the sort of girl to go and buy a newspaper. Well, as we've got it, we may as well read it. What does it say? Our detested despot. What? Dear me, here's your biography. And it says, oh, it can't be. What? Can't be. Why, it says that although you are going to marry me tomorrow, you were betrothed in infancy to the Princess of Monte Carlo. Oh, yes, that's quite right. <laughs> Didn't I mention it? Mention it? You never said a word about it. <laughs> that's like me. Well, it doesn't matter because, you see, it's practically off. Practically off? Yes, by the terms of the contract, the betrothal is void unless the Princess marries before she is of age. Now, her father, the prince, is stony broke and hasn't left his house for years for fear of arrest. Over and over again, he has implored me to come to him to be married, but in vain. Over and over again, he has implored me to advance him the money to enable the princess to come to me. But in vain. I am young. <laughs> Not as young as that. And as the princess comes of age at two tomorrow, why at to tomorrow, I'm a free man. So I appointed that hour for our wedding, as I should like to have as much marriage as I can get for my money. I see. <laughs> of course, if the married state is a happy state, it's a pity to waste. Why, anymore. every hour we delayed, I should lose a lot of you, and you'd lose a lot of me. My thoughtful darling. Oh, Rudolph, we ought to be very happy. If I'm not, it'll be my first bad investment. Still, there is such a thing as a slump. Even in matrimonials. I often picture us in the long, cold, dark December evenings, sitting close to each other and singing impassioned duets to keep us warm and thinking of all the lovely things we could afford to buy really? if we chose it, <sighs> and at the same time planning out our lives in a spirit of the most rigid and exacting economy. It's the most beautiful and touching picture of connubial bliss in its highest and most rarefied development. As o'er a penny roll we sing, it is not 
not reprehensive to think what joys our wealth would bring where we disposed to do the thing upon a scale extensive. This rich mock turtle thick and clear. Perhaps we'll have it once a year. You are an open-handed dear. No, mind you, it's expensive. No doubt it is expensive. How fitting are the glutton joys. With fish and how he likely toys And pays for such expensive tricks Sometimes as much as two and six As two and six As two and six Sometimes as much as two and six It gives him no advantage, man For you and me have only dined And you remain when one sits down by half a crown. By half a crown. By half a crown. Yes, two and six is half a crown. Then let us be modestly merry and rejoice with the dairy down dairy. For to laugh at the thing, no extravagant spring is the joy economical dairy. Then let us be modestly merry and rejoice with the dairy down dairy. For to laugh at the thing, no extravagant spring is the joy economical dairy. tried to hide it. I moisten my insipid fare with water which I can't bear. Nor I, I can't abide it. This pleasing fact of holes will cheer with 50,000 pounds a year. We could indulge in table beer. Get out. We could. I tried it. Yes, yes, of course you tried it. Who oh, he who has an income clear of 50,000 pounds a year. Two shilling gloves, two shilling gloves. Yes, think of that, that two shilling gloves. Cheap shoes and ties of gaudy hue, and Waterbury watches too. And think that he could buy the lot where he a donkey, which he's not. Oh no, he's not. Oh no, he's not. That kind of donkey he is not. Then let us be modestly merry and rejoice with the dairy down dairy. For to laugh and to sing is a rational thing, it's a joy economical berry. Then let us be modestly merry and rejoice with the dairy down dairy. For to laugh and to sing is a rational thing, it's a joy economical berry. Now for my detective's report. What's this? Another conspiracy? A conspiracy to depose me? And my private detective was so convulsed with laughter at the notion of a conspirator selecting him for a confidant that he was physically unable to arrest the malefactor. Why? It'll come off. This comes of engaging a detective with a keen sense of the ridiculous. For the future, I'll employ none but Scotchmen. And the plot is to explode tomorrow, my wedding day. Oh, Caroline. <laughs> Caroline. <laughs> She's perfectly frightful. What's to be done? <laughs> I, I don't know. I ought to keep cool and think. But you can't think when your veins are full of hot soda water and your brains fizzing like a firework and all your faculties are jumbled in a perfect whirlpool. Tumblification. I'm going to be ill. I know I am. 
I've been living too low. And I'm going to be very ill indeed. When you find you're a broken down critter Who is all in a tremble and twitter With your palate unpleasantly bitter As if you've just bitten a pill When your legs are as thin as dividers And your plague with unruly insiders And your spine is all creepy with spiders And you're highly gambled in the gill Repeat! Repeat! When you've got a beehive in your head And a sewing machine in each ear And you feel that you've eaten your bed And you've got a bad headache, a headache down here When such facts are about and those symptoms you find in your body or a crown, it's a shady look out. You may make up your mind that you'd better die down. Go at once, go at once and lie down. When your lips are all smeary, like tallow and your tongue is decidedly yellow with a pint of warm oil in your swallow and a pound of tin tacks in your chest when you're down in the mouth with the vapors and all over your morris wall papers black beetles are cutting their papers and crawly things never act When you doubt if your head is your own And you jump when an open door slams <coughs> Then you've got to a state To a state which is known to the medical world as Jim If such symptoms you find in your body or head, they're not easy to quell. You may make up your mind you are better in bed, for you're not at all well. No, you're not at all well, not at all. Now for my confession and full pardon. They told me the Grand Duke was dancing duets in the marketplace, but I don't see him. Hello, who's this? Why, it is the Grand Duke. Who are you, sir, who presume to address me in person? If you've anything to communicate, you must fling yourself at the feet of my acting temporary sub-deputy assistant, Vice Chamberlain, who will fling himself at the feet of his immediate superior, and so on, with successive foot flinging through the various grades. Your communication will, in course of time, come to my august knowledge. But when I inform your highness that in me you see the most unhappy, the most unfortunate, the most completely miserable man in your whole dominion... Are <laughs> you the most miserable man in my whole dominion, <laughs> How can you have the face to stand there and say such a thing? Why, look at me, look at me. Well, I wouldn't be a crybaby. A eh? crybaby? <laughs> if you had just been told that you were going to be deposed tomorrow and perhaps blown up with dynamite for all I know, wouldn't you be a crybaby? I do declare that if I could only hit upon some cheap and painless method of putting an end to an existence which has become insupportable, I would unhesitatingly adopt it. You would? <laughs> I see a magnificent way out of this, and by Jupiter, I'll try it. <coughs> Are you by any chance in earnest? <laughs> in earnest? Uh, look at me. If you are really in earnest, if you really desire to escape scot-free from this impending, this unspeakably horrible catastrophe, without trouble, danger, pain, or expense, 
Why not resort to a statutory duel? Uh, a statutory duel? Yes. The act is still in force, but it will expire tomorrow afternoon. You fight, you lose, you are dead for a day. And tomorrow, when the act expires, you will come to life again and resume your grand duchy as though nothing had happened. And in the meantime, the explosion will have taken place and the survivor will have had to bear the brunt of it. Yes, that's all very well, but who will be fool enough to be the survivor? Actuated by an overwhelming sense of attachment to your grand ducal person, I unhesitatingly offer myself as the victim of your subject's fury. You do? Well, really, that's very handsome. I, I dare say being blown up is not nearly as unpleasant as one would think. Oh, yes, it is. It mixes one up awfully. Ah, but suppose I were to lose. Ah, that is easily arranged. Calm. I'll put an ace up my sleeve and you'll put a king up yours. Ah. And when the drawing takes place, I shall seem to draw the higher card and you the lower. Ah, there you are. Ah, but that's cheating. Ah, so it is. I never thought of that. Uh, no, not that I mind. But I say... You won't take an unfair advantage of your day of office. You won't go tipping people or squandering my little savings on fireworks or any nonsense of that sort. I'm hurt. Really hurt by the suggestion. You wouldn't like to put down a deposit, perhaps? No, I don't think I should like to put down a deposit. Oh, give a guarantee. A guarantee would be equally open to objection. It would be more regular. Mm -hmm. Really well, I suppose you must have your own way. Good. I say... We must have a devil of a quarrel. Oh, a, a devil of a quarrel? Just to, to give colour to the thing. Uh, shall I give you a sound thrashing before all the people? Uh, Say the word, it is no trouble. No, no, I think not, though it would be very convincing and it's extremely good and thoughtful of you to suggest it. It is a devil of a quarrel. Oh, a devil of a quarrel. And no half measure, big words, strong language, rude remarks. Eh? Who the devil of a quarrel? No. The question is, how shall we summon the people? Oh, there's no difficulty about that, bless your heart. They've been staring at us through those windows for the last half hour. Come hither, all you people, when you hear the fearful news. All the pretty women, we both men, will shiver in their shoes. And they're all my lord defenders, when they learn the fact tremendous. In the statutory duel, this civilian man of shoddy, this contemptible nobody, the Duke does not refuse. Oh, Mr. Duke, Mr. Duke, Mr. Duke, And pick it strong. Walk into me abusively. I've several epithets that I've reserved for you exclusively. A choice selection I have here when you are ready to begin. No, you 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 begin. Small bombs break and the little ones put him in a pillory, break him in a pillory. Long thought, 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 tough thought, and little ones break him into pits, blow him into pits. You must, sir. You know, sir. Enough, sir. Get out, sir. I hit, sir. Hit that, sir. Hit it, 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 Of the needy ones. Who are you alluding to? Where are you alluding to? Hats, not stills, not swells, not the pity ones. I'd rather think of her to the newly purred. To you, sir. To me, sir. I do, sir. You see, sir. I hear, sir. Quinn, eh, sir. Look here, sir. I say, sir. It's a fatality. It's a fatality. It's a fatality. Oh, 
want her. You mean, of course, by duel, verbum set. A statutory duel. What is that? According to established legal uses, a card apiece each bold dispute chooses. Dead as a doornail is the dog who loses. The winner steps into the dead man's shoes. Dead as a doornail is the dog who loses. The winner steps into the dead man's shoes. Agreed. 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 Up comes the pack. Behold it here. I'm on the rack. I quake with fear. First go to me. If that's the case, behold the king. Behold the age. <laughs> Yes, yes, I'll come to life tomorrow. My Lord Grand Duke, the world a journey best to your convenient cell in your hotel. Oh, my consent of you. Quickly run in hour twenty four, much may be done. <laughs> oh, a monarch who boasts intellectual greatness can do if he likes a good deal in a day, can put all his friends in conspicuous places with plenty to eat and with nothing to pay. You'll tell me, no doubt, with unpleasant cremations tomorrow, deprived of your ribbons, and later you'll get your dismissal with very long faces. But wait, on that topic, I've something to say. I've something to say, I've something to say. Oh, our rules shall be merry, I'm not an ascetic, and while the sun shines, we'll get up a hay by a pushing and monarch up to an energetic. A very great deal may be done in a day. Instances measure his ancestor drew it. This law against you will tomorrow will die. The duke will revive and you'll certainly rue it. He'll give you what for and he'll let you know why. 
but in 24 hours it's time to renew it with a century's life. I've got right to imbue it. It's easy to do. And by jingo, I'll do it. It's done till I perish. Oh, Monica, my, oh, Monica, my, oh, Monica, my. Monica, 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 I do not pretend to be very prophetic. I fancy I know what you're going to say by pushing a monarch of turn energetic. A very great deal may be done in a day. This very afternoon at two about, the court appointment will be given out to each and all, for that was the condition according to professional position. Hurrah! Hurrah! Oh, according to professional position. According to professional position. Then, oh, hurrah! 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 Why, what's the matter, what's the matter, what's the matter, what's the matter? Oh, with me, my comrades, true, who love as well, I know you do this gentle child. Lisa, who is so humbly there? Why, what's the matter? Why, what's the matter? Each sympathetic heart will grow. From his connubial, from his... Though marriage contracts, or whatever you call them, are very solemn. Dramatic contracts which you all adore so are even more so. And it's true, the marriage contracts are very solemn. The marriage contracts are even more so.
Where will she go? What will she do? That isn't in your part, you know. Oh, quite true. Depressing topic we'll not touch upon. Let us begin as we are going on. For this will be a jolly cot for little and for big. From on the night, a night will be as merry as a grig. All status ceremony will eternally abolish. We don't be too insistent upon unnecessary polish. And on the whole, I'd rather think you'll find our old colorless. The jolly jolly ding. The jolly jolly ding. The jolly 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 ding. But since your new maid coat without a costly coat is, we shall require some coat that has the most a moment's notice. In clothes of common coat, your coat just must not grow up. Old Athens will exhume the necessary dresses, correct and true, and all brand new. The company possesses, and for a court costume, shall live in song and story. For we'll appraise the dead old days of Athens in her glory. It will be a jolly cot for little and for big. From on tonight, a life will be as merry as a grig. Bring me the jolly, 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 jol